Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I am working on a bit of an impromptu character design. So I started scribbling out a gesture and, and started with some, some scribbly exploration of different design avenues. And I stumbled upon something that I liked and decided to push it all the way to a finished uh, painting stage. So today we're going to talk a little bit uh, a little bit about the different stages of that process and uh, take this character from A to Z. So starting with a blank canvas all the way to final polish and uh, and, and finishing touches. So for my personal work, I tend to start with some sort of gestural figure. Um, I think it adds a lot of character to the to to the character, a lot of personality. Um, and it kind of gets the ideas flowing. So, so uh, often a gesture will inspire some sort of story. So in this case, um, this this gesture, I think it might be a bit of like a zombie reference or uh, maybe like an abstract dancer of some sort. But I, I thought of it more of like a, a dancer. So I really like that big S curve moving through the body and thought that I could extend those lines and create some sort of uh, ancient Mesopotamian um, fantasy inspired dancer or merchant or, or something like that. So, um, so during the initial exploration, I tend to have my Pinterest open and um, if ideas come to mind, I just do a quick search and see what I can find. Um, and the idea isn't to follow a specific reference, it's just to take in sort of the the larger um, like the, the larger group of pictures and, and the feelings that you get from those pictures and process it and kind of put it down on the page as visual design. So um, so I'm not copying one reference more than another. I'm taking little ideas from all over the place, including a lot from my imagination and just laying down uh, different accessories and different uh, fashion elements and shapes um, and trying to push uh, the sort of basic structure of the character as much as I can in this initial sketch stage. So it's one thing to, you know, kind of block out a, a figure and kind of scribble stuff on, on the page, but it's another thing to be like actively, actively planning a design. So that's really what I'm, I'm thinking about in my head as I'm, I'm laying down these lines, I'm planning out a design with different, um, different design philosophies and strategies in mind. So if I put down a certain shape on the page, I'll try to repeat that shape in other places. I'll try to uh, use shapes that complement each other and uh, shapes that complement the figure and the fashion so that the overall design kind of works as a, as a whole. And, um, and it's not just a bunch of like cool objects, but mashed together with no logic behind it. So, yeah, so um, that initial design, um, you can see I'm mixing elements that are really skin tight and then really big elements that are far from being skin tight. You know, they're very uh, voluminous. And I think that just creates an interesting contrast in the fashion and also helps the gesture come through. So if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of loose clothing, um, you'll, I'll start to lose the, the interesting gesture that I have. So I'm trying to balance that, you know, I, I have potential for an interesting kind of um, figure and, and to show off some interesting anatomy with this particular gesture. So for the character design, I will, you know, strategize and, uh, and try to reserve some opportunities to show um, the interesting gesture. So the next sort of attempt or next kind of exploration, and I'm really jumping around, um, for these kinds of explorations. I had no concrete idea in mind, um, but you know, just scrolling through my Pinterest, I stumbled upon this, um, this reference of like a, a girl with a jean jacket and you know, sweater around her waist. So I decided to you know, sketch that out, see what that looked like, um, see if I could complement the flow of the gesture with the flow of the clothing. And um, yeah, and that actually turned out uh, to be an avenue that I thought could be interesting, that had a lot of potential. And, um, and I kind of pushed it 
down that road. So um, the final sort of thing that I, I explored just before going into anything um, like committing to any particular design is uh, is just to try out some sort of cyborg mecha elements, um, something that's always fun to practice. Uh, you take a, a figure drawing and just turn it into a cyborg. And that also just um, is good practice for, for hard surface design and having your hard surface design follow um, a gesture or, or anatomy. So I'm exploring that and, um, and you can see that eventually I will combine those two ideas to do this kind of like punk uh, street style character with um, with a jean jacket, but also with the, some cybernetic elements and, and some robot robotic elements. So, so I like this jacket flowing out to uh, the right hand side, and I am, and and I don't need to commit to anything. So I can change, exaggerate the the figure if I want. So here I change the uh, the way that one of the arms were posed so that I could create a bit of an S gesture with a kind of transverse line that's cutting through with the uh, with the flow of the arm. So you have a line that's kind of going from the bottom arm and flowing all the way up through the shoulders and uh, and then whipping back around with that, that, top, that top arm. And I'm extending those lines with a weapon. So I, you can see I put a gun in her hand um, actually, in, in both her hands, I'm planning to have like pistols, and those pistols aren't just you know so so that she's dual wielding pistols, which you know is is cool in its own right, but uh, they're actually just to extend those gesture lines of the arms. So, and that's also why she's holding them that way. So she's pointing the bottom pistol down, and that extend that extends the gesture all the way down to to the ground, and then. Um, the other pistol is pointing up, so it's kind of like leaning on her hair and it's pointing up through her head, and that kind of creates this uh, sort of Nike swoosh um, gesture line going through her arms. And then uh, the rest I'm kind of uh, just decorating, exaggerating some elements, um, so pushing you know the, the hip out a little bit more so that that gesture reads um, you know, in a, a bit of a more exaggerated way. And then I also added a weapon um, by her hip as if she's carrying like a, like a big chain gun or something like that. And uh, the angle of that barrel is actually creating a sort of an, another dynamic line through her figure, which is um, accentuating the angle of her hips. So the pelvis is leaning over, um, you know, towards the left hand side in this case. and that the barrel of that gun is is following that line across. So you have kind of one line accentuating the angle of the shoulders, which is, you know, the, the gesture line going from one arm through to the other. And then we have this opposite angle that's tapering in the opposite direction for the, the angle of the hips, and that's accentuated by the barrel. So just some little strategies, uh, little illustration strategies. It's always useful to kind of extend the lines of your your gesture or the structure of your character so that um, so that the the image just flows in a nicer way and uh, yeah so now I have the basic idea down on paper it's kind of it's really scribbly um, and this might not be something that like I show an art director uh, but it's enough for me to kind of start shading in some some different planes and and start designing some sh shadow sh shadow shapes and and, um, and light shapes and fleshing out the design in a in a more volumetric way. So I have a basic uh, bounding box around the design of my figure, and I'm kind of working within that and resolving. I'm I'm doing two like two things at once. I'm resolving the design and also establishing the main volumes of the design. Uh, and doing some basic rendering to, to kick things off. And uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite parts where I can just, you know, hop in and, and st start sculpting the, uh, the design out of, you know, almost out of thin air. Um, so I pulled up some portrait references 
and match the angle of the head that I had in my initial uh, figure reference. And yeah, I'm just kind of combining a whole bunch of different features and a whole bunch of different accessories from, um, from mo mostly my imagination, actually. Um, I'm not using that many references for this, this figure. I'm just kind of enjoying the, the drawing process and, um, and having fun just sketching stuff out on, on paper. But uh, for, for the most important elements, like the, the head, um, some of the folds in the jacket, and the, the basic anatomy, especially in the torso, which has a, a pretty significant um, bend to it, I do have some reference, you know, some mostly anatomical reference and, um, and portrait references. But for the, the rest, you know, um, I, I can now rely pretty heavily on my experience drawing, you know, different kinds of clothing and, and different accessories and stuff to to rely on my imagination for a lot of um, a lot of the drawing portion um, especially for the the clothes and the, the mech stuff the hard surface stuff and I'm okay with it not being a hundred percent realistic um, I think the the most important part in any drawing is that the shapes of the light and shadow and the shapes of your silhouette the shapes of the different design elements those shapes need to be interesting and um, and interesting doesn't always mean realistic. So um, you might have a reference which has, you know, it, it might be a photo um, of a real thing, but it might have, it might not have nicely designed shapes in it. Uh, you might have a lot of like parallel lines or orthographic lines, which make the, which make the image really static and flat looking, or you might have super flat lighting. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of factors that you know, might not be helping you in creating an interesting design if you pick a, the wrong reference. Um, but, you know, knowing what makes a, a shape interesting or what makes your lighting interesting um, is, is just a useful tool when, you know, when, when fleshing out a design like this because um, you can rely on that, that fundamental knowledge to, to create an interesting image and, and less on... Um, copying something that's like already figured it so i think the the key points to creating something really interesting um is unbalance or a lack of a lack of balance and for lighting that means that you'll have um either more shadow like let's say more than 60 percent shadow and less than 40 percent light or the opposite, where you have more than 60% light and 40% shadow. And that, that, unba that imbalance in value will create a, a more dynamic lighting scene. I'm also um, you know, creating a, a lighting scene that's coming more from one side than the other, just slightly, so that it's not stat like statically um, perfectly in the center. And for shapes, um, three-dimensional and two-dimensional that just means shapes that aren't symmetrical so the more symmetrical your shape whether it be a circle or a cube or even an equilateral triangle you know you have many axes of, uh, of symmetry and that creates a very static shape so I'm focusing on creating a lot of uh, ellipses and um, kind of wedge shapes with the light and shadow a lot of um, a lot of triangles that don't have equal lengths and edges and angles and a lot of sort of trapezoidal like tapering um, tapering wedge shapes for for you know every single brushstroke that I, I put down on on the page basically so um, yeah um, I think also for for lighting like a my main strategy is to, to lay down some sort of core shadow um, to establish what the main volume of the shape is going to be. And then I can come in and, you know, uh, scribble in some half tones. And once I have a, a good idea of what that uh, volume is going to be, then I can start sculpting the, the more, um, the more superficial forms of the, of the shape. So that just, you know, it, it's just working methodically to move towards something that is more accurate 
um, but starting with you know big broad strokes and um, I, I just find that kind of approach helps my brain process what I'm looking at because if I start you know detailing right away then I can't really see what I'm working on and um, and, the, and the shapes kind of come as a surprise later instead of you know being established from the get-go So a lot of this hard surface design um, is following the flow of the anatomy. Uh, generally, hard surface design, like good hard surface design, feels a little bit organic in a way. So I'm, I'm taking into consideration um, how, how the joints of the hip and leg work, what direction the knees are pointing in, and all sorts of factors like the, the main sh shapes of uh, the quadriceps and the hamstrings and um, all the different muscle groups to make my hard surface design on the legs uh, more interesting than just you know some cylinders and you know once I've established uh, some main volumes I can start designing the clothing around it so I'm almost designing especially the skin tight stuff I'm almost designing it like a hard surface that follows the anatomy so kind of introducing cut lines and that will dictate where the boundaries of the clothing are for that like sort of sports bra section you know I'm I've tried different cuts and stuff and um, and trying to find something interesting and uh, for the looser fitting clothing like the jacket uh, it's a lot in abstract shape design and, and designing interesting folds so I sort of jot in some folds, but I think I do go in and liquefy some stuff a little bit later just to um, just to accentuate the movement across those folds. So those folds, uh, you have different categories of folds. You have, you know, zigzag folds and um, diaper folds and half locks and spiral folds and um, and using those different kinds of folds in different areas will either keep your eye moving. For example, like a spiral fold is, is very flowy and kind of wraps around the form. So that'll keep your eye moving across the form and around the form in a, dy in a dynamic way, where uh, zigzag folds like you see on the, the lower arm, sort of in between the shoulder and the elbow where it's being compressed, those, those folds kind of keep your eye in one place they're pretty static um, it's kind of that like repetition is locking your eye into that that area and uh, and I don't necessarily want that so I think when I go in and, and liquefy it a little bit later I'm actually kind of angling those folds more so that they wrap a little bit more around the form of the arm and that'll just help the uh, the eye sort of travel down the arm in a more fluid manner. Here, having a lot of fun uh, just designing, you know, hair shapes and little accessories like the the light bulb earrings. Um, I couldn't. I think throughout the whole design process, I was uh, I was debating um, actually making those earrings into light bulbs or just, you know, kind of having a, a sort of blown glass. Uh, piece of jewelry with with some metallic spirals or something c coming around it and I think at the very end um, actually I'll, I'll let you guys um, watch it all the way through to the end and, and you can see what I ended up doing but um, I didn't really commit to either one um, now here I'm resolving a little bit of the anatomy of the neck so that's really one area it's a really tricky area especially with a head um, that's angled this much. So you have a lot of staggered overlapping muscle groups like um, like the sternocleidomastoid that leads into the, the clavicles and sort of pit of the neck. And when your head is tilted over one way, one will be flexing more than the other. And the other will be a little bit more relaxed but will be extend, extending out quite a bit more. So that asymmetry can, can create a lot of issues um, in, in a, in the neck area to resolve nicely, but it does give an opportunity for some interesting shape design too.
And it's also, um, like, I think of the head almost in, like, in all cases, because I'm, I'm a very uh, character-focused artist. The, the face and the head is pretty much always my, my main focus. Um, so I think of the head and, and what is around it as the focal area, and I spend a little bit more time and a little bit more care um, trying to resolve things around the head so that it frames the head and the face nicely. So I, you know, I've started working on the face first and I come back to it uh, many, many times throughout the whole design process just to make sure that it's appealing and making sure that, um, you know, that, that you want you actually want to spend a lot of time looking at it because if it's not um, if it's not nicely resolved, if you don't have nice shapes or nice shadows casting on it, um, or if your your facial features are not placed properly, then it's a it's a quick sort of write off. Like you you might um, you might just like turn off a viewer from your your drawing um, just because it, you your face doesn't have really appealing forms. So I just, you know, I come back to it uh, a lot of times throughout the process and, and just make sure that it's it's doing the trick. Um, here, you know, resolving, pushing, and pulling shapes and, and really kind of sculpting the hard surface, the hard surface uh, as if I was working in 3D. So the fact that I established those main shapes early on, you know, with just the core shadow and some halftone, um, I can now kind of really push and sculpt the, the independent, um, the little paneling and, and different secondary uh, hard surface shapes. And here I did a little, uh, little cheeky um, cheat, I guess. Um, so the, the two guns are actually the same gun and, and they're in such a similar position, like in, in perspective just rotated uh, facing the camera that I decided to just rotate it, modify it a little bit. Uh, obviously I need to change the lighting direction because the light is coming more from the, uh, the right hand side. So did a cheeky little uh, copy paste and flip and relit the gun so that it would save me a lot of time, especially since it's the same gun design. Um, I didn't want to draw it twice. So this is just me being um, you know, lazy, but finding, finding a way around, um, my laziness, I guess. <laughs> um, and then here, a good trick for any time your, your character is holding something is to just draw the whole hand under or around, um, what, what it's holding. So whether your character is holding a staff or a weapon or a vase or a, you know, a it could be a ball, it could be any object for that matter. Um, to kind of draw the hand underneath just helps, um, it just helps you resolve that that junction because it can be really tricky to pose a hand around something and you don't want to spend a lot of time erasing the object that um, they're holding, especially if it's something complicated like this pistol. So I've uh, drawn it out and then, you know, depending on how it looks when it's actually holding the the weapon I'll adjust from there so I did adjust the fingers so that they uh, accentuate that accentuate that gesture a little bit more so the fingers are pointing down um, but I did want a really delicate uh, like grip on that pistol I didn't want her to be um, holding it really firmly because the pistol is kind of almost falling out of her hand and um, I'm not sure in, in the moment, I didn't really have a reasoning, but I do think it really adds to her personality. Um, it feels kind of nonchalant and very relaxed and a little bit suave. So I'm, I'm happy of, with how, how that turned out. And um, yeah, so uh, this other pistol is going to cause me some, some issues now because the, uh, the hair is quite complicated and has a lot of abstract shapes, but that pistol is, you know, interfering because it's, uh, it's overlapping it. So I'm going to have to work around it, but, um, but that's just, you know, the, 
the cup of poison that I, I decided to, to take for this drawing. So I could have tackled it a different way and kept that pistol on another layer, but um, I, just, I just wanted to draw, so I don't mind working around it um, and, and, you know, fixing things, erasing things and, and redrawing. Um, and here you can see, this is what happens when you try to uh, just design the hand around the weapon. So I'm struggling quite a bit more with this, um, trying to get a gesture that feels natural. And, uh, but you know, I do decide on kind of keeping my initial sketch, but I knock it back ever so slightly so that I can adjust the drawing underneath. So I'm planning um, on a layer, on a separate layer above my drawing and then adjusting my drawing underneath to kind of match my plan and then, you know, uh, polishing things up. So just a different strategy than the, the way I did it for the other arm, but you know, yields a, a similar result. And here, you know, just uh, working out all the different junctions. So I think junctions, um, I, I mentioned them in quite a few of my videos, but it, you know, it, 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 they're super important areas in a drawing. Whenever something ends and something else starts, for example, like the, the sleeve cuff where that ends and the wrist begins, it's always a, a nice place to add a little bit of detail. Um, and, and it really just eases the transition from one area of the drawing to the next. So whenever you have two materials meeting, you might put a seam or you might put a little border or you might accent, accentuate the edge with a little bit of flair or a little bit of detail. And that just makes things fit together nicely, almost like, like puzzle pieces, right? Um, you know, puzzle pieces or <laughs> a puzzle pieces. Puzzle pieces aren't just like uh, squares that abut each other on one side. You know, they have a little wedge or a little, uh, you know, one little piece is concave and the other little piece is convex, convex and it shows that they connect properly. And um, junctions are should be treated the same way in drawings where connections should be made obvious, whether, um, whether it's the way objects overlap and press against each other so you can see that the force the, the force that's being applied or uh, if it's a mechanical element you know how those mechanical elements tie together what kind of joint is it is it like just a, a one axis joint or a two axis joint is it a gimbal is it a pulley is it like um, like what how, how does it connect how does it rotate um, and, and really showing the function around those junctions and um, and you can do that in the design. It's really important to do that in the design, but you can also do that with color. You know, if you, um, something you see often when a shadow is cast, the edge of the, the shadow might have a little bit of a pop of red or a pop of orange, and it kind of eases that transition from shadow to light. So your shadow might be a cooler color, like a cool blue color, and your light might be a stark yellow. So that line that separates them might kind of be ugly and, and feel unresolved without that little um, transition of like saturated orange. So, you know, the junctions apply to, to all different um, different contexts and, uh, and, and there's something really worth thinking about. Here kind of working out the other weapon. So this is a I, I want to keep a similar shape language to the rest of the hard surface um, on this character, so I didn't want to come in with some really uh, like military-looking chain gun. I wanted to keep the, the elegance and the, the little organic feel that I have on the rest of her, um, her cybernetic legs and, and her pistols. I wanted to keep that shape language, so um, it's kind of a, a more sci-fi gun with a little uh, bipod to stabilize it. And honestly, I don't really know how like these guns function. I, I don't really have a plan in mind and I'm really not like a weapons uh, specialist as a designer. Like I have been ripped apart so many times by people in the comment section um, 
telling me that I don't know how pistols work and how guns work and how the sights are backwards on on my weapons and um yeah they're they're most of the time they're they're completely right um but I don't really care that much about knowing how weapons work I, I just want to create sort of interesting visual storytelling and um and I think when when I'm designing weapons I I just leave a lot up to imagination so you know I'll have little I'll, I'll um indicate some sort of function but a lot is left up to interpretation on uh, you know why there are vents in certain places and why it's a certain shape and what tube leads into what area and you know it, it's it's kind of leaving the story up to the the viewer um and i i think that's enough for weapons um some people really geek out a ton uh on on weapon design and you know it's super great but i think uh for my character illustrations the the most important thing is that the overall design feels cohesive and and the whole is really greater than the sum of its parts so if the weapons or the jacket or the clothing or you know even the the shoes and the mecha stuff like if if they're not a hundred percent resolved that's okay because the whole drawing will feel like it's resolved at the same level and the visual storytelling will kind of uh, bridge the gaps between those unresolved areas if that makes any sense <laughs> so um i think you you that strategy is used a lot in more stylized art where you kind of create abstract shapes and you leave it up to the uh the audience to kind of link uh different elements together for example in, in animation you'll have smear frames where a character is really uh, stretched out or really squashed and you know when you stop on that frame it looks completely ridiculous like the the character is completely disproportionate but when you look at the whole animation you know it it links one um one pose to the next or one frame to the next and you can do it a sort of similar thing with um, we're just resolving everything in, in the same way. So uh, a lot of areas might look a little bit wonky and abstract, but as a whole, they kind of create the illusion of realism or the illusion of uh, something looking detailed or complete. Um, and sometimes you just need to indicate in a couple areas, like really resolve the design and, and really make it more detailed. and. Uh, and, and that just solidifies the illusion that something looks detailed. Uh, I actually use that, that strategy a ton in the hair. Uh, so the hair is, you know, a, a mess of curls. Um, and I really didn't want to spend, you know, the, I think this, this whole design process, including the, the painting, um, was just under nine hours. So I didn't I didn't want to spend all those nine hours just drawing every detail of these uh, of the curls and the hair and but I still wanted to convey like the texture and the the volume of the hair so you can see that I'm concentrating a lot of the detail in at the very tips of the hair um, and close to the face like on the the um, like at the hairline you can see little curls and stuff coming kind of draping onto the face so uh, just placing details in those particular areas will will kind of frame the rest of the hair and um, uh, another thing that really helps is that the hair is going to be really dark so um, the fact that you know most of the detail is seen in the silhouette will just create the illusion that there's all, all sorts of um, texture and, and, and curls and um, and different volumes within that, that mass of hair. You can see actually a, a similar strategy for that jacket. So, uh, so just like ripping up the edges, like fraying the edges of that jacket and, you know, having the cuff, um, kind of flare out in a, in an, in a disorganized fashion. 
um, kind of creates the illusion that it's a really old jacket, but I'm not actually filling the jacket with a bunch of holes and, um, and discoloration and, and crazy ripples and stuff. It's just, I'm treating the, the, the silhouette with, um, with how, you know, I want the, the intention of the jacket to, to come across as. So I want the jacket to feel old and kind of worn. Um, so I concentrate that detail around the silhouette and, you know, they, the, the viewer will complete that, um, that story by themselves, you know, subconsciously. So now I have uh, resolved the design to my liking and I am moving into the coloring stage. So whenever I start a painting, um, the first thing I do is mask out the silhouette. And this is a little bit time consuming and really quite tedious, but it saves me tons of work down the line um, just, just because it keeps my silhouette nice and clean. And I can also see, um, I can judge certain things about the painting and about the design as I'm working on it just based on the silhouette. So it's just a good way to kind of double check that your design is working properly and um, and that, you know, if the, if the silhouette read is really good, if, if the shapes are really interesting in the silhouette, then uh, then you can pretty much, you can paint almost anything within, within that silhouette and it'll still look good. Like the initial read will be, um, you know, very legible and, um, and the drawing is legible as well. So like the, dr the drawing here is doing 90% of the work for me. And, um, and the silhouette is doing another, like <laughs> another, like 9%. So the 1% of like coloring that I'll do, um, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but the last portion of, of, um, I guess the, the, not the effort, but so much of the work is already being done by the drawing and the silhouette that um, that painting is just going to be the sort of cherry on top. So I'll still paint, you know, I'll still try to paint this really nicely um, and, and push it as far as I can, but uh, everything is already established. Like the design is resolved and the the whole read is, is there already. So uh, in this hair area, I'm keeping the silhouette pretty blurry and that's because I'll come in like hair is a very soft material so I, I, I'll let it bleed into the background a little bit and that kind of gives the illusion of, of transparency uh, without having you know to draw a whole bunch of individual hair strands and uh, when I go into color this is a strategy I use quite a bit um, especially for for concept art in like a like a game industry context. So I use the lasso tool with like with no anti-aliasing and no feathering or anything like that. And that just gives me really clean selections while I'm blocking in colors so that I can change colors really quickly uh, like I'm doing here. So, you know, just taking a quick selection, adjusting the colors, and that really lets me establish my main color scheme and the main color harmony um, really quickly. So I kind of start with the big separations, like I started, you know, blocking out the legs and the fashion, like the, the jacket and the skin. So like those three big elements, and then I can work um, on smaller elements and separate those out. So starting with the primary color blocks, and then uh, coming in with the secondary and tertiary color blocks. So here, these are like the secondary, um, second like secondary little color areas little accent colors and um and eventually i even chop up the uh the the bigger white um cybernetic legs with like a a sort of off white color like something that is uh, a little bit contrasting but still in the same color family and then, you know, just chopping up material. So everything is based on material, um, not just what color, um, like what colors do I want in different areas? I'm, I'm really thinking about the material. So um, if, for example, the 
legs are like a fiberglass or like a carbon fiber um, composite material or something like that, then, then they can be super flashy. But I would never make the jean jacket super flashy because it's supposed to be old and worn. Um, so I'll keep it pretty desaturated. It might be like, you know, um, like a, a blue jean jacket. So a brand new blue jean jacket will be quite, uh, quite saturated, quite blue. But, you know, as it wears over time, as it gets sun faded and, uh, you know, as the pigment starts to rub off, it, it'll kind of leave lighter white patches. So uh, I'll start with a darker blue color and I introduce some, some lighter tones. And here you can see I'm, I'm cutting up uh, that white part with a, a color that's just maybe 10% or 5% um, darker in value just to give a little bit of a, a tertiary color, color breakup. In terms of color theory for a, a character, I, th I, I really um, believe that simpler is better. So keep, keep things really simple um, when you start and then gradually add complexity to your color scheme and stop when as soon as your your color scheme is uh, is readable, so that just you know it, it avoids having a, an overly noisy concept um, and keeps things concise. So just lots of lasso selections, colored block ends. Sometimes I'll use, like like you can see here, I use the pencil tool um, to scribble in some areas. For the light bulb earrings, I'll keep them uh, the color of the hair because they'll, they'll just be transparent glass. I don't need to color them blue or something. And um, at this point, I create a layer on top and I start to uh, Using you know my basic soft brush, I start to block in some some gradients and some glazes of color over my um, my color block in. So I've established that I want this kind of golden white color scheme for most of the character, and then I I'm pulling this sort of desaturated teal color as the complementary. And uh, and the teal it just works nicely against like the warm tones of the skin and and the armor and there's also um, like the gold is kind of playing off is kind of um, you know harmonizing well with the, the the colder white tone of the the armor so I kind of have this two this like warm versus cool scheme going on and I'm knocking back my background so something I, I, I do almost always is to bring my background to a 50% uh, fifty percent gray. And that just lets me judge the values that I'm, I'm placing for, you know, the different colors and as I'm painting up a character. So I like the presentation of a white background, but as I'm working uh, so that, you know, my colors aren't getting too dark or too light, I, I, I use a 50% gray background just to get that that medium um, that medium value in the right spot. And now I'm creating a color dodge layer. So this is a super useful tool if you just want to make stuff really shiny. Um, you create a you, you create a color dodge layer and just fill it with black and layer lock it and you paint in with white. So layer locking it will make uh, make it non-destructive. So if you erase back to black, so you can see what my foreground and background color are. So I'm painting with white and erasing with black. So when I erase, it'll go back to that black background. And, um, and, and what that does is it just like, because it's a color dodge layer, it'll so, sort of blow out the highlights and give it a bit of a metallic feel to your highlights. And when I erase away, I can just sculpt the highlight. So I don't want my highlights to just be straight brush strokes. Um, I want them again to be nice shapes. So I'm creating a lot of 
little wedge shapes and little triangular shapes, um, some some dynamic uh, dynamic looking highlights, just to keep things um, visually interesting. And I can also work between my different layers. So here I have basically uh, three layers that I'm really working quite a bit on, actually four. So I have the color mask layer, which helps me mask things quickly. I have a layer on top of my color masks where I'm just painting and rendering stuff. Then I have my drawing. And my drawing is set to, uh, I think, linear burn at 50%. And then I have my color dodge layer. So my color dodge layer is just to do all the highlights. And I'm working in between those, um, kind of back and forth, adding some rim lights. Um, and yeah, just I paint up, I think, 90% of my, my character like this. And at the very end, I'll kind of um, create one last layer on top of everything that is merged together and just work on that. So here working a little bit on the different um, tones in the skin. So I am getting a little bit of head ahead on this just because skin is a super complex material with subsurface scattering and a lot of color variation. So, um, so yeah, I'm tackling this pretty early and um, yeah, just sort of starting to render up the skin. So I want the skin to feel, you know, to feel warm uh, and feel organic and natural. So I am introducing quite a bit of like orange and yellows in the highlights to make those, those highlights pop a little bit. So it's a, a bit of a warmer light source and the uh, the shadows I'll keep a little bit cooler. So if the highlights are more yellow, the shadows are a little bit more red. Not to say that red is a, a cool color, but it is cooler than yellow. So um, yeah, it's, it's again with that dichotomy, warm and cool, I used it in my, my overall color scheme, you know, with the blue and the, the, the gold. And uh, I use it again in, in the way I'm lighting the figure with, you know, um, warm highlights and, and cooler shadows. I'm also kind of concentrating the contrast with the highlights in the face and on that top sort of weapon so that the, the focal point stays the the portrait, you know, stays the face. So even though I do detail out everything else, I, I just keep the contrast a little smidge um, more like um, more prevalent in, in the face and make sure that things that are far from the face are uh, a little bit lower contrast. So you can see I put a pretty hot highlight on that gun that's pointing down and then I realize that there's too much contrast there and that, that is distract, distracting um, from the face so I just knock that highlight back um, yeah just to keep the focus up towards the face here adding some little metallic highlights this is also a really fun part for me it, I think it adds so much to the the form when you add those little highlights and just something about the, the color dodge layer and the way it uh, mani manipulates the underlying color with you know adding more saturation. It just feels so highlighty. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's just um, it's just really satisfying. So here I want the uh, the other gun uh, to have so sort of the opposite color scheme of the armor. So if the armor is like white and gold, I want black and gold so I, I chose a sort of darker gunmetal for the uh, I'm, I'm just gonna call it a chain gun it might not be a chain gun but um, the big the big gun the 50 cal so looking back at how I did the jean jacket I think I should have just painted the whole thing um, on one layer, on one layer, 
uh, you can see that the highlight that I put on the 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 little um, worn out parts at, at the bottom of the jacket they're quite saturated they're like a, a pretty intense cyan color and that kind of makes the jacket feel a little too metallic and um, yeah, I think I, I should have just strategized a little bit better or try to convey that material a bit better by keeping the um, the the value range a little bit more um, compressed so that it feels like matte, like a matte material instead of a, a glossy material. Um, but, you know, I got carried away with my highlights and that's just, that's life. I'll learn next time. <laughs> um, but you know, jean, jean is also a pretty fun material to, to render just because there's uh, a lot of different fiber colors and, and, and you can go a little bit wild. It's almost like an organic material, but not quite. You're blocking out some other little shiny gold components, little buttons. With all the gold she's wearing, she's probably worth a lot of money. So now working a little bit on the face. So I think I took a day, uh, a break between start, like before I started working on this face again. And immediately when I came back, I noticed that the skin felt pretty dead. Um, so I added some warmth into the, the shadow and kind of lifting those um, those shadow values and that just kind of helps you know make the the face feel a little bit lighter and more alive so i uh you know th i think this might be the the fourth or fifth pass that i do on the face and now i'm detailing out um trying to find like the final look of this portrait so detailing out the eyelashes kind of resolving all the little little surface anatomy of, of the nose and the lips and trying to hit those those final key values and and materials so i mean i say materials it's all skin and makeup but um you know that they have different levels of glossiness and you know she's wearing eye makeup which is slightly metallic so kind of hitting those key beats in those areas And again, like your best friend is reference um, for portraits. If you feel like your portraits don't feel lively or feel a bit generic, um, you know, always, always a good idea to pull up some, some reference. Um, so I think I had three or four portrait references up and just pulling little details from each one. Um, now I'm glazing some cooler colors into the hair that kind of contrasts the, the warmth of the face and reworking the face again. So at this point, um, it's mostly polish. So I have most of my, um, like most of my materials rendered out pretty well. Um, but there are some areas that, you know, might be lacking a little bit of, uh, a, either a little bit of detail or a little bit of interest, whether it be, you know, color variation or texture. Um, so you can see here I'm reworking the hair, I'm pushing sort of the, the values of the hair to, to basically the darkest darks um, that I want in my image. And um, yeah, and kind of just polishing all of the different areas of my image um, for that like final, final presentation. So here I do a lot of texture work. I don't want to detail out every hair because like I mentioned earlier, I could spend a whole other nine hours um, drawing every single hair, every single, every single curl, but I don't have the patience for that. So I want to convey that um, there's voluminous curls and that there's texture. And, um, and you can see that I'm trying to figure out a way of doing that with with just the shape design and the silhouette and uh, still leaving transparency. So it's a, a little bit of experimenting with, um, with how I'm, I'm painting this and how I'm creating the, the illusion of this um, 
textured hairstyle. So it's not quite like a, um, how can I say it, like a, it's not like a homogenous afro. So um, there are still clumps of curls that are, you know, moving in a certain direction. And I'm trying to convey that with a, some, a couple, um, a couple strategically placed highlights inside the, the shape of the hair and then extending those um, highlight shapes out all the way to, to the silhouette so that you get these kind of points that are forming at the silhouette. Um, and, and I think that just creates a more interesting shape to the, the hair than if it were just, you know, like a, a perfect sphere, <laughs> um, which also is less realistic. It might work for something stylized, but I think that breakup in the silhouette is ended up as uh, something quite interesting. So detailing at the fingers. So besides the hand or besides the face, the hands are pretty important. We tend to look at hands uh, quite closely. So I'm just detailing out her nails and uh, adding a little bit of color variation in the knuckles. So the with her, her dark skin tone, the inside of the, the palm of the hand is going to be slightly lighter than the outside and a little bit more desaturated and red. So I'm kind of glazing in some of those colors to make those adjustment, uh, adjustments. And um, yeah, and I just introduced a little tertiary color with the, the color of her nails, still keeping it in that cool range and not doing something too flashy. So it's got that, that light violet, um, just to make something different. I could have played off again, um, like played off the gold or I could have made it cyan or something, but you know, they're, they're tertiary colors, so they're not super, super important. And here glazing over some more highlights. So, um, for the overall lighting scheme, like I said earlier, I want to create the most contrast in the head, but I don't want that contrast to be too, uh, segregated, I guess. Like I, I want there to be a nice gradual, um, like a nice gradation of contrast that ends with the, the face being the most in contrast. So you can see that I, I kind of glazed over some highlights in the abdomen area so that the there's a little bit more like highlights and a li little more contrast there leading up to the head. So uh, basically the, the gradation of the contrast follows the, the flow of the gesture and, uh, and just, you know, leads, leads your eye around the figure. And I'm doing some, some tidying up on the cybernetic components. And this is really, you know, final touch ups, um, cherry on top, you have some decals, little patterns and that sort of thing. So, uh, I was trying to think of something to write on her shirt. And, um, I think I was listening to, to some house music or something, but there was, a like a renegade song going on. So I wrote renegade, uh, gives her a little bit of a, cause it's edgy and people like edginess. It's also almost not leg like legible, um, with the way it's, it's warped across her top, which is good. You know, I don't want it to be too, too legible, but you know, if people really want to pay attention to it, then, then they can read it hopefully. And that just adds a little bit of, uh, a little bit more visual interest to, um, to her top as it's leading up toward the face again. So the, uh, so I wouldn't slap like a big decal like that on the bottom of the legs because it would demand too much attention. But, um, you know, on, on her shirt, the legs are really quite simple, quite, quite visually restful. So, uh, the, the eyes kind of, you know, traveling up the legs and then, you know, they might take a little, little pause on the shirt to try to read what's there. And, and really rest on, on the face where I want people to be spending most of their time, most of their attention. And even if the face is really important, um, I'm still spending some time, you know, resolving the, the design of the legs. And this is just me, you know, liking a, an overall, 
a clean design. So I'm uh, kind of polishing up these areas, adding some little highlights, kind of refining the shapes and the, the, the surface finish of the, the painting. And as you can see, I'm, I'm working on a, a separate layer now with everything merged together so that I can paint over stuff that I don't like it if, if I so choose. And uh, I'm also adding a s small like black outline to the outside of my shapes and that just you know cuts cuts shapes out, cuts different components out. Um, and you can see I'm still resolving some stuff so I didn't like the, the panel cuts on that piece. So I wanted something that was a little bit uh, less cut in half and so I created sort of a small, medium, and, and large panel shape. And now just working over this lace part of her shirt. Not much, not much left of that, but still a fun little texture breakup. I think adding uh, little textural changes is, um, is is a really good way to, to keep a character design interesting too. Like in um, in still life paintings, you'll often combine um, different materials. Like you might have a metallic vase and a ceramic vase with a pattern on it, and you might have some grapes and an orange and a cloth. And all those different materials, the different levels of glossiness, the, the surface textures, it creates a really visually interesting painting. And, um, and if you happen to compose it nicely with, with nice lighting and stuff, and you happen to um, choose objects which harmonize nicely in color, then, then you end up with a really, really interesting painting. But even just with the material variety, it, it's way more interesting than if you have the same material everywhere. So here, you know, I have, um, you know, skin, I have a very polished sort of composite material for the, the robotic legs. I have a super shiny metal. I have gun metal, which is much more matte and kind of scratched. I have jean, I have sort of lace, um, a more kind of polished sort of polyester looking shirt, um, like a synthetic looking material. And uh, and kind of like leather shoes, which have a little bit of, of glossiness to them. I have the very matte curly hair, so lots of variation in, in material. Um, so just a strategy to keep my, my character design interesting. And here is where I experiment with this sort of light bulb effect, but I don't push it too far. I think in the end, I just stick with a, um, a kind of purple glow which is a little bit reminiscent of her purple fingernails, but that's pretty much it for the, um, the character design. Um, these final little touch-ups are just little glows and, um, and final presentation, but uh, that's gonna be it for this character. I, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and, um, and learned something from the, the A to Z process and I'll see you guys in the next one. Ciao.